Hello, and welcome to our next lecture uh, in our physiological psych psychology series uh, in this section on sexual behavior. Uh, today we're going to be talking about reproductive hormone cycles. In particular, we'll talk about uh, the structure and functions of hormones, and in particular, uh, how hormones uh, are released and controlled uh, by the hypothalamus. Uh, we'll start by talking about how hormones are classified by both chemical structure, their function, and their source. So the way we think about hormones really just depends on our approach. So there are peptide and protein hormones, steroid hormones, which is where we'll focus much of our attention today, and then finally there are amino acid-derived uh, hormones. So the protein and peptide uh, hormones tend to be things like insulin, uh, which is released by the pancreas and helps control our blood sugar. Uh, steroid hormones, which we'll talk about uh, primarily today, are all synthesized from cholesterol and then form a steroid nucleus based on that uh, cholesterol molecule. And then finally we have amino acid derived hormones, which are things like epinephrine and thyroxine, which come from uh, amino acids. So the steroid hormones are critical to human reproduction, development, aging, and are associated with a variety of cognitive functions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there is a great deal of work going on in trying to understand how steroid hormones influence cognition uh, and sort of in what ways. So we talked already about how uh, testosterone activates um, visual spatial abilities in uh, people. It's also believed that estrogen may actually benefit memory. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about those cognitive functions in our next lecture uh, after this one but we first need to get a bit of an understanding about what these hormones are and where they come from. So this is uh, a bit of a hot mess of a slide, I understand, um, but this gives you all the details you might need about how um, reproductive hormones are formed. Uh, so these are all of their chemical structures and also includes all of the enzymes that make these transformations possible. I want to point out a couple of important ones in here because they do have uh, quite a bit to do with uh, some things we've been talking about. We'll start down here with 5-alpha reductase. Remember in our last lecture we talked about how 5-alpha reductase deficiency uh, results in some different um, sexual development. That enzyme is right here uh, converting testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. 17-beta HSD is another important um, enzyme which helps convert uh, androstenedione into testosterone, uh, which then can be converted into estradiol. Um, and then 3-beta HSD is another important one. We're going to talk a bit about uh, a steroid hormone called dehydroepiandrosterone. Uh, this is actually something you can take over the counter. You used to be able to take androstenedione over the counter, but that has been banned, but you can still take DHEA. The problem is, is these enzymes all relate to whether or not you're going to convert that DHEA into testosterone, estrone, estradiol, or estriol. And so it's a really complicated picture. So this is a more simplified pathway. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we start with cholesterol, all of these. Cholesterol is actually something that uh, is important for our hormonal functioning. So we're going to be talking primarily about testosterone and the estrogens, which is estrone and estradiol. We're also going to talk a little bit about this DHEA um, because it has uh, been used in uh, some instances to try to improve cognition in uh, postmenopausal women and some of the research I've been involved with. And we're also going to talk quite a bit about progesterone and pregnenolone. Um, so one of the things I do want you to notice is progesterone uh, is pretty closely related to corticosterone and um, cortisol. And one of the things we know about cortisol and corticosterone is uh, they oftentimes are problematic for things like cognition, in particular memory. And we seem to see some of this in progesterone as well. Progesterone has both positive and negative effects in the brain um, in different ways. Progesterone tends to increase um, olfactory uh, abilities. Uh, particularly in animals, and, and it's even seen in women, or pregnant women, I should say. Um, but we also know that there are some costs uh, to high levels of progesterone, and some of those things include cognition and memory. <coughs> so first thing to understand 
about the activating effects of steroid hormones is they bind to membrane receptors just like any other neurotransmitter. They enter cells and activate certain kinds of protein in the cytoplasm. So um, they bind to chromosomes where they activate or activate certain genes. Um, they bind to receptors like neurotransmitters, and they activate uh, certain proteins in the cytoplasm. So they have very complex activating effects. So they act like neurotransmitters, but they also act in other ways. And so this is really important for us to try to understand the overall picture of how uh, steroid hormones are affecting behavior and infecting, uh, are affecting the brain and uh, even brain development. So <coughs> one of the uh, most important uh, aspects of how reproductive hormones can affect behavior and affect the brain has to, of course, do with the menstrual cycle. So in women, the hypothalamus and pituitary interact with the ovaries to produce the menstrual cycle. Uh, the menstrual cycle is, of course, a periodic variation in hormones and fertility over the course of about 28 days. This is obviously up or down depending on um, the individual, but tends to be around 28 days. Now, women who are on oral contraceptives oftentimes have a um, much longer time period between their um, menstrual cycles. In fact, some women um, take their oral contraceptives or other types of contraception in such a way so as to limit the number of menstrual cycles. It's something to talk with your doctor about if it's something you have a question about. So after the end of a menstrual period, so this is kind of where we start, is at the end of menstruation, uh, which is really generally the start of the menstrual cycle, um, is uh, when the anterior pituitary releases follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. So follicle-stimulating hormone promotes growth of a follicle in the ovary. And so that follicle in the ovary will eventually become an ovum, which then will get released and has the potential to be fertilized and then become, of course, um, a fetus. So that follicle nurtures the ovum uh, and starts to produce estrogen. So towards the middle of the menstrual cycle, the follicle builds up receptors to follicle-stimulating hormone. As a result, the follicle produces increasing amounts of estradiol. So follicle-stimulating hormone is being released by the anterior pituitary. It's traveling down to the ovaries, it's causing a follicle to be created. That follicle then builds up more receptors to follicle-stimulating hormone, so it, absor it gets affected more by FSH, and so it starts in producing increasing amounts of estradiol as it gets these uh, receptors built up. <coughs> so you can see here that um, at the end of menstruation begins uh, what we call the follicular phase, which is when the follicle builds up. We then get what's called the periovulatory period, then the midluteal phase, the luteal phase, and then uh, menstruation. So estradiol peaks in the week following the end of menstruation. <coughs> uh, progesterone peaks during the midluteal phase, as you can see uh, in the center part of this graph. So at about, so if we start on the clock on the first day of menstruation, we're talking about day 21 or so is about the mid-luteal phase. Both hormones then drop during the late luteal phase, which is the premenstrual period. And it's this drop in hormones that oftentimes can be associated with behavioral um, mood disruption, depression, um, irritability, bloating, all this kind of stuff um, that it, we associate with premenstrual um, periods is associated with this drop in hormone levels. Uh, it's kind of almost like a little mini menopause uh, each month. So and this can be difficult for some women. Uh, some women find it much easier to deal with. Everyone's a little bit different in terms of uh, how their body responds. And if it's something you're concerned about, it's always something uh, worth talking to your doctor about. So um, as we get increased estradiol, uh, this causes the anterior, anterior pituitary to increase its release of both uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So these two hormones cause the follicle to release uh, an ovum. This is, of course, then uh, what has the potential to be fertilized. So this is the point at which fertility is the greatest is once um, that ovum is released. And that's actually in what we call that paraovulatory period. Um, 
that from uh, this time of ovulation uh, on through uh, is the time at which uh, fertility is its highest because this is when ovulation occurs and this is when uh, the uterus has uh, prepared itself uh, for pregnancy. So uh, menstruation and immediately after menstruation uh, are when um, fertility is at its lowest. <coughs> And this is, of course, how um, people across the ages have uh, attempted to control their fertility is through uh, what's called the rhythm method. So the remnants of this follicle, follicle then release the hormone progesterone. This prepares the uterus for implantation of a fertilized ovum, uh, inhibits the further release of luteinizing hormone. And so this is when we start to get um, more buildup uh, of the uterine wall. We get um, increasing amounts of progesterone being released by that remaining follicle. So it looks something like this. At the end of menstruation, we get the follicle stimulating hormone traveling down to the ovary, which then causes the follicle to form, which starts releasing estradiol. Then we get the follicle developing more, releasing more estradiol because it's absorbing more FSH. Then we get ovulation. Um, once the luteinizing hormone has come along. And then that remaining follicle is releasing both estradiol and progesterone. Um, and then we get to menstruation and we start this cycle all over again. So these are these interactions between the pituitary and the ovary. <coughs> uh, we will talk uh, in our next um, lecture about how uh, reproductive uh, or contraceptives, sorry, disrupt this process uh, and prevent ovulation. We'll also talk about uh, developments in uh, male contraception as well. But for now, let's talk about the testosterone cycle. Um, testosterone levels work on a negative feedback loop. The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. These then travel through the blood to the gonads, to the testes, I should say, causing the interstitial cells in uh, the testes to release testosterone. Testosterone then causes the hypothalamus to discontinue releasing gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which then reduces the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which then reduces the amount of testosterone being released, which then means we go back to having lower levels of testosterone, and now the um, hypothalamus releases more GnRH, which then causes the um, pituitary to release LH and FSH, which then causes the testes to release testosterone. So that's why we call this a negative feedback loop. The testosterone comes back, feeds back on the hypothalamus, and causes a shutdown of the release of GnRH, which then causes a shutdown of these other hormones, which shuts down testosterone release. Once those testosterone levels uh, drop, then the hypothalamus starts releasing GnRH again. <coughs> so in terms of how this all um, works out for uh, males, uh, younger males tend to have uh, what we call a diurnal um, levels of testosterone, peaks at night and then early morning, and then drops off during uh, the day and evening. For older men, uh, it tends to be relatively stable across time. Um, but for younger men, uh, you get much higher increases in uh, testosterone at nighttime. And of course, for very younger men, uh, for young men, oftentimes this can result in things like nocturnal emissions. So that is uh, a quick introduction to reproductive hormones. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about reproductive hormones and cognition and talk a little bit more about um, uh, contraception.